Welcome to Pavenars, webinars for the pavement community. My name is Andrew Bram, and we'll be talking about what is Mechanistic Empirical, the 2020 update. The original Mechanistic Empirical Pavenar was held and recorded on December 6, 2011. It was posted on YouTube on September 6, 2018, and it has garnered over 1,000 views, so thank you. And because of this, we're going to update the content here in 2020. So what we'll talk about today is a background and the need for mechanistic empirical design, some of the advantages and disadvantages of ME design. We'll talk about the principles of ME, which includes the application of engineering mechanics and the rational design process. We'll move into the AshtoWare PMED, and we'll start with an overview of the pavement mechanistic empirical design and the components of the software. And then we'll give some brief examples from the state of Missouri, including a Portland cement concrete example, a hot mix asphalt example, and some rehabilitation of existing pavement, which is a new feature in the software. And I'll be using ME to represent mechanistic empirical throughout the presentation. The need for mechanistic empirical design comes from some discussions in the mid 1990s when the Federal Highway Administration or FHWA's National Payment Design Review found that 80% of the states in the United States used the 1972 1986 or 1993 AASHTO design guide. And all three of these guides are rooted in empirically based performance equations that were developed using the 1950s AASHTO road test data. So in the mid 90s, 80% of the states were using a pavement design method based on data collected in the 1950s. And they decided we need to move in the direction of ME. And when we talk about ME, there are two components. The definition, according to Webster's New World College Dictionary, the fourth edition, of mechanistic is matter moves in accordance with the laws of nature, whereas the definition of empirical is relying or based solely on experiment and observation rather than theory. And so what the FHWA thought was we need to combine these concepts of mechanistic and empirical design. And through this survey in the mid 90s, there was a demonstrated need for a design guide that's based as fully as possible on mechanistic principles, realizing that there would be an empirical component. Now, what are some of the reasons they went in that direction? Well, some of the major deficiencies of the 72, 86, and 93 AASHTO guides is climate effects, because all of the data was collected at only one geographic location. Another deficiency was the subgrade, because all of the data was only collected on one type of subgrade. There were only two surface materials, one hot mix asphalt and one Portland cement concrete mix. There were only two base course materials, they were unbound, dense granular bases, and rehabilitation techniques were not considered. So you can see, while this was a very innovative study for the time and much needed for the pavement community, it really was quite limited in scope. Now, as a small side note, if you go to Ottawa, Illinois, and head a little bit west of Ottawa, Illinois, you can visit the ASHO test road site. And you can see here a picture of myself under the sign it is a definitely place to visit if you're a pavement engineer. Some other deficiencies include tra traffic loading. Traffic loading today is 10 to 20 times higher than it was in the 50s and 60s when the ASHO road test was executed. There are whole hosts of new truck characterizations, which include suspensions, axles, and tires. And you can see a unique axle configuration taken in Sydney, Australia below. 
as far as construction and drainage goes, they used very old techniques of construction. There's been a lot of innovations in the construction industry, and there was no sub-drainage. Now we recognize that drainage is a very important part of any successful pavement structure. The design life of the pavement was only two years. Now we try and design roads for 20, 30, or even 50 years. The performance measured in the 7286-93 AASHTO guides was only related to layer thickness, and the procedure was never fully validated, which meant it had a low level of reliability. So you can see a whole host of deficiencies in these guides. And again, at the time, it was a very innovative study, but since then, there's been a lot of advancements, and we recognize that it's not a one-size-fits-all type strategy. So what are some of the advantages of mechanistic empirical design? Well, ideally you reduce early favor, failures because we incorporate significant material properties. So there's a lot more inputs that are available to be placed into the design. And features can be directly considered. For example, you can actually quantify the strain at the bottom of the hot mix asphalt layer. And we can try and then correlate that to the amount of fatigue cracking that happens that occurs in the field because we know that strain at the bottom of the pavement layers does correlate to fatigue cracking in the field. Another advantage is that you have an increased pavement life, which ideally would lower facility construction and rehabilitation costs. With that increased pavement life, you would also reduce delay time for highway users. And over the life cycle cost of the pavement, you could potentially decrease the cost by at least 5%. But this does vary due to the design of the pavement, the materials, and the construction of the pavement. Some other advantages of ME design, and this was recognized from the 1986 AASHTO design guide onward, is that we have new loading conditions available to evaluate. We have a better utilization of available materials. We have improved procedures to evaluate premature distresses. We can also examine the consequences of base erosion under Portland cement concrete pavements. We can see some of the long-term benefits of drainage. There is a much more there is a much more robust climate analysis within ME design, and you also include the aging of the pavement materials, which is a very significant. Um, variable that goes into the performance of the paving materials. So lots of advantages that we can see here with mechanistic empirical design. However, there are some disadvantages. Number one is the cost. The most recent ME design software, and you'll see many different terms out there, pavement ME, MEPDG, AASHTOWARE, PMED. There are many terms out there but it is $7,000 for an individual workstation annually and a site license, which is multiple workstations, is anywhere from 28 to almost $56,000 annually. So there is a significant cost associated with the ME design. It is also very complex because of the new loading condition, because of the significant climate data, it actually analyzes the climate every one hour which means that for each design, it's up to 15 minutes per run. So that takes quite a bit more time. And also it's what I call a black box because there are many tasks in the background and there are numerous documents out there describing those tasks. But at the end of the day, it is, it is quite complex and you just have to trust you're putting the inputs in, you press go and then the outputs will come out. And there's a whole lot going on there in this iterative process with all the climate data. And then finally, um, this is actually a pro and a con. There are three levels of design inputs. For level one, you have site and material specific inputs. Level three at the bottom, you use regional or national defaults. And then level two is kind of somewhere in the middle. And this is nice because you have the opportunity to use a lot of data from the materials that'll be used on the project, data from the climate that is there data from the traffic that it will be on that project. So you have a lot of opportunities for a high level of accuracy, but that also is much more expensive to collect all that data. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. You have the opportunity to use more accurate data, but the cost and the work associated with obtaining that is also much, much higher. 
So the, the three levels of designs are, are kind of a, a pro and a con. So that's just an overall background of the print of mechanistic empirical design and the need for it. And now we're going to go into the principles of mechanistic empirical design. So as we stated, mechanistic is the application of engineering mechanics and rationality. And this is bridging the measures and the causes. So the measures are a lot of the mechanistic portion of it, and the causes and the results are more of the empirical side of things. So when we think about engineering measures, we talk about the stresses, the strains, and the deflection in the pavement layer, and we want to bridge that to the physical causes, so the loads that are applied and the material properties of the pavement structure. And there's two ways that we can do this. We can either use a multi-layered elastic system, or we can use a finite element modeling option. So let's take a look at these multi-layered elastic systems and finite element modeling options. So for the multi-layered elastic systems, you assume that the material properties in each layer are homogeneous. So all the way from your base to this, um, the base, the subgrade, the subbase, those are kind of the unbound materials, then moving up in the pavement structure, the base course for asphalt concrete, the binder course for asphalt concrete, and then the surface course for asphalt concrete, or a rigid Portland cement concrete slab. Regardless of what layer you're looking at, the material properties for each layer are homogeneous. You assume that each layer has a finite thickness, so you are only looking at layers that have a known thickness. One of the things then that you have to think about is in theory, the subgrade, the natural soil that the pavement structure is sitting on uh, is not applicable with this concept of finite thickness, but it is a part of the multi-layered elastic systems. You also assume that each layer is isotropic, which means that the properties are the same in every direction. So whether it's horizontal, vertical, left, right, uh, forward, backwards, all the properties are the same. We assume that there is full friction at the layer interface and there's no surface shearing. So this means that everything stays one homogeneous or one uh, single block and there's no movement between each of these layers that you've established. And then within each layer being isotropic, that means that the Poisson's ratio and the elastic modulus, so mu and E, is the same regardless of which uh, direction you are going. In. And because this is a multi-layered elastic system, you'll notice that we're using elastic modulus. Now, when we're thinking about mechanistic design, we want to think about the stresses in the vertical, the radial, and the tangential planes. So there are three normal stresses, and recall that stresses are simply a load over an area, and we call those sigma z, sigma r, and sigma t. And these act perpendicular to any element faces, as you can see in the picture to the right. There are six shearing stresses, and those are all represented by tau, and it is in the RT, the TR, the RZ, the ZR, the TZ, and the ZT directions, and these act parallel to the element faces. So while there's no movement between the layers, there are shear stresses associated within the material. And if we can quantify these normal stresses and these shearing stresses, what we can do is we can calculate the strains that are generated. And remember, the strains and pavements are definitely a very good way to then move toward distresses in the pavements. And you can see down there that the strains are calculated using the stresses, both the normal stresses and the shearing stresses, and also the elastic modulus and the uh, Poisson's ratio. And what we can do is we can calculate these strains and other strains using equations like this, and we can build on these general equations. So there are more equations out there with those shearing stresses that are similar in theory to the one shown here, but there are literally dozens of equations that are available in the layer, multi-layered elastic system analysis. And these general equations then are used for three properties. And these three properties are the relationship between 
the stress and the strain, whether or not it's linear or nonlinear. And that comes into play especially for uh, asphalt concrete materials because those are viscoelastic. So we have to think about the concept of the time dependency of the strain under a constant stress level. So it can be a viscous behavior or a non-viscous behavior. And you can see on the right the combination of a spring and a dash pot is a combination of elastic and viscous behavior, and that's called the Maxwell viscoelastic model. And then finally, the third property is the degree to which material can rebound or can recover strain after the stress is removed. And this is the plastic or the elastic component. So we have these three different properties, the linear versus nonlinear, the viscous versus non-viscous, and the plastic versus elastic. So all of these then go into the general equations that we saw in the previous slide and also the other equations that can be used in the multi-layered elastic system in order to take the stresses being applied and measure the strains that are coming out. Now, in addition to the multi-layered elastic system, we can also use a finite element procedure. And this is where we divide the pavement and the pavement layers into small and discrete portions. And these have nodes and elements. So below you can see all of the four-sided shapes are elements, and those are connected to other elements by nodes. And this is an example of a crack in an asphalt concrete pavement structure. Now, one thing here that is of interest is that you can see at the bottom of that structure, the nodes are very large, and that's because the subgrade goes to infinity. So this is one difference between a finite element procedure and a multi-layered elastic system, is that your layers can go into infinity. But regardless, you take all of these nodes and elements and you assign a behavior to each of the element. And you do this with different shape functions and different equations. You then assemble the elements and apply the boundary conditions, and then you solve functions and equations. So essentially what we're doing is we're assigning material properties to each one of the nodes and elements, then we're applying loads onto the nodes and elements, and then we can measure the displacement value, the stresses, and the temperatures at all of the nodes. And this is just another way then to see how loads move through a pavement structure and to see what kind of distresses start to form within the pavement structure when the stresses and strains start exceeding the allowable limits. Now everything we've talked about is the mechanistic portion. We've talked about looking at engineering measures, the strains, the stresses, and the deflections. We've been looking at the physical causes, the loads that are applied, and the material properties of the pavement structure. This is all the mechanistic portion. Well, what about the empirical portion? Well, the empirical portion of ME design guides starts talking about materials and then what sort of inputs are put into the materials. So we have these material properties, we have the stresses and strains, but what happens when we start putting traffic on it? What happens when we start exposing it to different environmental loads? And what we need to do is we need to relate the field performance data to the accumulated damage. And this is done by using what's called a transfer function. And a transfer function provides a theoretical computation of damage at a critical location to measured distresses. And what this means is that we're able to say we have this traffic, we have this climate being imposed on the pavement structure. We know the pavement structure has certain material properties, so we know how loads move through and strains are measured, but then how do those inputs all then relate to the actual distresses and the damage that is formed? So what we do is we take the traffic and the weather data, we put it through the design with the materials, and we're able to measure the stresses that could potentially come out of our design. And this is the empirical portion, is taking the traffic and the weather, putting it through the stresses and strains, and then actually getting some distresses out of that analysis. So now that we have a basic overview of the principles of ME design, we're going to move into the AsheToWare software.
And this is just one type of mechanistic empirical software available, but it's probably the most well known, at least in the United States. So in AshToWare, the mechanistic portion predicts critical payment responses, the stresses, the strains, and the deflection. And then the empirical portion is the relationship between the payment responses and field observed distresses. So how do these responses actually turn into distresses? And the design parameters that we use include traffic, material properties, the subgrade, climate, and the reliability level that we're looking for. And AshToWare provides recommendations for layer materials and thicknesses, new and rehabilitated pavements, subsurface drainage, and foundation improvement. So this is, in a nutshell, we've talked about most of these concepts already, but this in a nutshell is what AshToWare is able to do for us. And we can do this for either new construction or overlays. We can do it for flexible pavements or asphalt concrete. And we can also do it for rigid pavements, joint and plane rigid pavements, JPC, or continuously reinforced concrete pavements, CRCP. So lots of different options available for AshToWare. There are three stages to the AshToWare software. First, you do an evaluation of the climate and the environment. You do an evaluation of the existing site. You do an evaluation of the materials you're going to use. And you do an evaluation of the traffic. You then perform your analysis, and this is where the payment response model comes in. And we have incremental damage because on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, what happens is the climate and the environment and the traffic put loads onto your pavement and your pavement structure. And so you have what is called incremental damage. Over time, very small amounts of damage build up to major distresses. And those distresses are mapped into a transfer function. So a transfer function takes those models and the incremental damage and then measures the anticipated distresses that will form because of that. Then you have to select which materials and payment structures you want to use. And this has to do with the constructability, a life cycle cost analysis, and any sort of policy issues associated with the design. Now, a big part of what we've been talking about is the distresses. So what sort of distresses are explored in AshToWare? Well, for flexible pavement, you have rut depth, and you can have the rut depth in just the asphalt concrete, in just the aggregate base, in just the subgrade, or a combination of all three. There are different types of load-related cracking, including alligator cracking, fatigue cracking, and longitudinal cracking. You have different types of non-load-related cracking, including transverse cracking and reflection cracking. And then finally, you have the International Roughness Index, or IRI, which is the smoothness of the pavement. And this can be either for new construction or overlays. And the overlays can be asphalt concrete overlays over existing asphalt concrete or asphalt concrete overlays over rigid pavements. Now, the distresses for the rigid for JPC, jointed plain concrete, if it's a new pavement, you measure mean joint faulting joint load transfer efficiency, joint spalling, and transverse slab cracking, which is load related. For CRCP, or continuously reinforced concrete pavement, for a new pavement, you measure crack spacing and width, because CRCP pavements are designed to crack. Like you can see on the right, that is not a bad thing, but those have to be managed correctly, those cracks. You look at joint load transfer efficiency and punch outs. And then if we're putting a jointed plain concrete pavement over a flexible layer, this is an example of a rehabilitation technique in AshToWare, you measure the percent crack slabs and the longitudinal cracking. Now finally, the final distress is the International Roughness Index, or the IRI, this is the smoothness. This is only for new JPC and new CRCP. It is not used for the rehabilitation. Now there's quite a bit of information included in the AshToWare design software. So these are just the key components. First, we have performance indicator predictions, which are the distress equations. We have the design criteria and reliability levels. We have site conditions and factors, which include the traffic, the climate, and the in-place materials. So you can see there on the right, a picture on I-94 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You see the traffic, and obviously there's some climate issues going on there as well, and that will cause distresses in the pavement. 
Another key component is material properties for the new pavement. And then finally, the pavement design itself, the flexible and rigid designs, and the rigid has both jointed plane and continuously re reinforced. Finally, there are rehabilitation designs in AASHTO wear, and then how you interpret the results. So a whole lot of good information here in the AASHTO wear software and corresponding documents. The last three bullets, the pavement design, the rehabilitation design, and the interpreting results will have its own section in this recording, but we're going to go over the first four bullets here just briefly in this presentation. So we're thinking about the performance indicator prediction. Again, there are three levels of input. Level one is the highest accuracy. Level three, you use default values. One of the nice things is you can mix and match between inputs. So you can use some level three information and some level one information and some level two information. You don't need to have a single level for all parts of your design. If you search state research, there's been a lot of research on calibrating the pavement ME design guide. And this is because you can adjust for local conditions using calibration factors. So that's another way for performance indicator prediction to be accomplished. And this can be done through the distress prediction equations. And let's just look at one example for flexible pavements and overlays. You can see this is the equation for the asphalt concrete rut depth. So only the asphalt concrete rut depth. And all of those variables in that equation are the layer thicknesses, the temperatures, the confinement, coefficients, field shift constants, and layer thicknesses. So those coefficients and field shift constants are what are calibrated by local agencies and local um, users. This is just for the AC rut depth. You can also look at the rut depth of the unbound layers, the total rut depth, also many cracking equations and many roughness equations. And if you go through the design guides user manual, you'll actually see all of these equations written out. And this is what the black box portion is. This is where all the inputs go in. It runs through these distress prediction equations and the distresses come out. That was for flexible pavements. The next one we'll look at is rigid pavements and overlays. And we'll just look at the smoothness equation. And the smoothness, or the international roughness index, the IRI, is a function of the initial smoothness, any sort of cracks in the pavement, any sort of spalling, faulting. And it also has coefficients and site factors, which need to be calibrated. And just like asphalt concrete, there are other equations available for cracking, faulting, load transfer efficiency, and punch outs, and so on. So these are just two examples, one for flexible, one for rigid, of the performance indicator predictions. So looking at what sort of inputs are necessary to try and predict the actual asphalt concrete rut depth that will occur. Now the next component that we'll cover is the design criteria. And there are four pavement types and 10 performance criteria. We will go over two examples of pavement types and their associated performance criteria. So one of the four pavement types is asphalt, concrete, pavement, and overlay. And one of the performance criteria under the asphalt, concrete, pavement, and overlay is transverse cracking length, which is thermal cracks. And you can see that the threshold value at the end of design life recommended is 500 feet per mile for interstates, 700 feet per mile for primary roads, and 700 feet per mile for secondary roads. And so after the analysis is performed using your materials and your pavement structure, you can measure did your transverse cracking length go over these threshold values. And if they did, then the pavement design or the pavement material is not acceptable and you need to execute another design. A second example of a pavement type is SJPCP overlays of flexible pavements and the associated performance criteria for SJPCP is percent longitudinal slab cracking. And again, you can see there are recommended threshold values for interstate, primary, and secondary and it is 10%, 15%, and 20% of slabs having a percent longitudinal slab cracking recommended. Now you may be asking, what does SJPCP stand for? It stands for Short Jointed Plain Concrete Pavement, 
and this used to be known as bonded concrete overlays of asphalt. So this is replaced a Portland cement concrete overlay over an asphalt concrete pavement, and you have a bond between the two layers. And the terminology that's used in this software is SJPCP. Now going on to the reliability levels. Now the reliability levels, this is something that was in the uh, 93 AASHTO design guide as well, but these are the consequences of reaching terminal condition earlier than design life. And we'll show an example here with IRI. So we have some sort of IRI average value, and that's in the middle of the distribution, but what the reliability does is it recognizes that there is some sort of uncertainty associated with the predicted IRI, and therefore you have some sort of distribution of potential IRI and you can control how wide of a distribution you want to have. And as, you, as time passes, so time here is on the x-axis, in general, IRI increases, you have some sort of average in the middle, and then you have some sort of minimum and maximum value allowable, and what you want to measure with this reliability is how far out does this distribution go. And the further out the distribution goes, the quicker you will reach the failure because the quicker that distribution will then overlap with the IRI failure. And the higher the number, the wider the distribution. So a freeway is 95%, principal arterials is 85 to 90, collectors are 75 to 80, and local is 70 to 75%. So you can see with the higher traffic volumes and the higher loads, you are less tolerant of failures, but with the lower traffic loads and the smaller roads, you are more tolerant of the potential for failure, so you have a lower reliability. Now, finally, some site conditions and factors that go into the design. You have your truck traffic and pavement ME, the Ashtoware pavement ME uses the axle load spectrum. And there are five different defaults available, or you can put in your own axle load spectrum. You can use the data from the NCHRP 1-37A project, and they also have a heavy, typical, light, and global category that you can choose. So lots of different options there with truck, tra truck traffic. As I've mentioned, the climate is processed on an hourly basis. This is why it takes so long to run the software is because it has to calculate the stresses and strains at every hour throughout every year throughout your entire design life. And they use the MERA2 and the NAR for the climate data. We need to look at the foundation and the subgrade soils. So this can include performing subsurface investigation, actually going out and getting some borings, and then taking that material back into the lab, running some tests, or even running more tests in the field on the actual material in place. And then if you're doing rehabilitation, you need to analyze the existing pavements. So these are some of the site conditions and factors that you need to consider in the Ashtoware Pavement ME. And finally, this is a, a little bit of information. It's actually a lot of bit of information on this one slide, but it's all very important because we need to know what sort of material properties we have for the new pavement. Well, before we talk about the material properties, what type of pavements are actually looked at? What sort of material within these pavements are looked at? Well, there's seven asphalt materials. You have stone matrix asphalt, you have dense open sand and stabilized based asphalt concrete, you have two different types of cold mix, cold central plant recycling and cold in place recycling, you have five Portland cement concrete materials, you have both high strength and lean intact material, then you have three different types of fractured material, crack and seat, break and seat, and rubbleized. You have six different types of chemically stabilized materials. You have open and dense graded cement stabilized aggregate. You have soil cement, lime cement, fly ash, lime fly ash, and lime stabilized soil. You have five different types of non-stabilized base, including granular, sandy, reclaimed asphalt pavement or wrap, pulverized and placed and cold recycled. You have seven different types of ashto soils at which go from A1 through A7, from the gravel to the sandy to the silty to the clay. 
And finally, this is the last bullet, you have two types of bedrock. You have both continuous back bedrock and fractured bedrock. So these are all the different materials that you can put in values for in Ashtoware Pavement ME. And remember, you can go anywhere from level one, which is highly engineered, to level three, which is mostly defaults, and you can mix and match between the materials you're using. But within all of these different materials, there are dozens and dozens of tests. For example, you can use dynamic modulus for asphalt materials. You can use flexural strength for Portland cement concrete materials. You can use resilient modulus for the chemically stabilized, the non-stabilized base, and the astro soils. You can use gradation for all of them. And the list goes on and on and on. So there are a lot of different inputs for each one of these different materials and each one of these different materials can be a part of your pavement structure. This is just a very brief overview of the material properties for the new pavement, but I really want to drive the point home about how much information you could potentially put in to the Ashtoware Pavement ME. Now finally, let's go from the Ashtoware uh, Pavement ME to some examples, and we're going to use the state of Missouri as some of our examples. So we're going to look at three sets of examples. We're going to look at hot mix asphalt, or HMA. We're going to look at Portland cement concrete, or PCC. And then we're going to look at a rehabilitation of existing pavement. And this is all from a Missouri Department of Transportation research project. So if you simply Google MODOT, M-O-D-O-T, C-M-R, 20-007, the PDF will be one of the first hits that come up. But the title of the report is the local calibration of the pavement ME for Missouri. The project number was TR 2016-09. It is MoDOT Research Report 20-007, and it was published June 2020. So this is hot off the press from when this is recorded. So let's start with hot mix asphalt. Well, hot mix asphalt, the different type of distresses that are measured are, for example, alligator cracking, which is fatigue plus reflection cracking. You have rutting, you have total rutting, you have rutting only in the asphalt concrete, rutting only in the base, or rutting only in the subgrade. And this is what you can see is a very common graph. And what happens is, is you run many different simulations using actual pavements that are already in place. You run many different simulations, knowing the material properties, knowing the existing pavement structure, knowing the climate, and knowing the traffic, and you predict how much rutting you will have using Ashtoware Pavement ME. After running it through the software, you compare that data to the actual rutting that happens in the field. And this is what the state local calibration is, is to try and get that R square value as high as possible and try and get as much of the predicting rutting to equal the measured running, rutting as possible. And this is a very common plot, and I do just want to point out the amount of variation in the data that you actually see. So this is a very complicated process that we're going through, and the more data you have, the better your results will be. The graph on the top is over many different projects. It looks like there's at least 100 projects that they used in that graph, but you can also look at a specific project as well. And here you have the amount of rutting over time. And you have the predicted rutting, which is the solid blue line, and you can compare that predicted rutting to what the actual rutting is in the field. And you can see for this specific project, there's actually only four data points. So there's not a whole lot of data that can be collected on each job. Now, if you recall, we saw the equation that's used for this um, back a couple slides ago. And we, there are calibration factors and site factors that can be adjusted to try and have better predictions. And that's what this calibration does, is it takes those equations, it takes the constants, it takes the site factors, and you adjust those for your state's data. So these are both examples for rutting. You can see very similar graphs for alligator cracking, for transverse cracking, and for smoothness and IRI. So these are the four primary outputs of distresses. They're a combination of different types of cracking or different types of writing, and you can get the smoothness. And you see very similar state local calibration and project calibration graphs for all of these distresses. Now, 
you can see similar graphs as this for the Portland cement concrete. But another thing that Missouri did is it looked at the impact of different type of inputs. So let's take a look at what they did for Portland cement concrete. They wanted to know, well, how much transfer slab cracking could we have based on the thickness of our layers? So what MoDOT did is they took layers that were 8 inches, 9 inches, 10 inches, 11 inches, and 12 inches thick, and they ran simulations using Ashtoware Pavement ME, and they measured the amount of transverse cracking that would come out of it. And you can see very quickly here on this highway that they were studying, 8 inches reached the threshold in about 5 years. 9 inches reached it in about 25 years, 10, 11, and 12 they didn't reach it within 30 years, the amount of transverse slab cracking. And this is very important because it shows that, well, how long do you want your pavement to last? If you only want it to last 25 years, maybe nine inches is enough. If you want it to last 30 years, is it worth putting two extra inches of asphalt, or excuse me, Portland cement concrete in your layer in order to go from what, about 5% transverse cracking down to maybe 2%, is that worth it? So there's a lot of things that you can explore using Ashtoware Pavement ME. The impact of the thickness. You can explore the impact of the dowel size on, for example, the transverse joint faulting. So if you have no dowels, you're, you have faulting in about one year. If you have one inch dowels, you have faulting within about three to four years. If you use one and a quarter inches, it's not until year 12. One and a half inches, it doesn't reach it until year 30. So this is the impact of the dowel size on transverse joint faulting. And then finally, we can look at the impact of flexural strength of the concrete on the smoothness, or the IRI. So you can see if you have a 400 PSI concrete mix, your smoothness will reach its threshold at about 10 years. And then the 5, 550, and 650, they're all very similar. Um, it looks like the 500 reaches at about year 28, but there's almost no difference between 550 and 650 PSI flexural strength. So with the HMA example, we saw all the state's roads, what is the anticipated versus the actual rutting. We saw one project, what is the anticipated versus the actual rutting over time. Here with Portland Cement Concrete, we could explore the different impacts of thickness, dowel size, and flexural strength on different types of failure. And then finally, for the rehabilitation of existing pavement, we're gonna look at the impact of changing the design of your overlay. So what we're gonna look at here is we're gonna look at asphalt concrete overlays and we're calling these OL. Now in MoDOT's report, they did have some discussion on JPCP overlays, but we're just gonna focus on asphalt concrete overlays. So you can see here, this is the total alligator plus reflection cracking. So this is fatigue cracking and it's looking at pavement age. And what they did is they looked at existing alligator cracking in the asphalt concrete. What happens when you put an overlay on top of that? So the dashed line is a road with existing alligator cracking that you put a overlay on top of. The solid line is a road without existing alligator cracking in asphalt concrete. And they looked at four thickness. So you can see just under a two inch overlay, you almost immediately have a significant amount of alligator cracking. So that alligator cracking reflects right through. Now the solid orange line is the line that's going up at about year four and it's a linear increase to year 20 or so. That solid orange line is a two inch, just under a two inch overlay on a road that does not have alligator cracking. So you can see putting a relatively thin overlay on a road with alligator cracking is probably not a good rehabilitation strategy. Now putting a slightly thicker overlay on, three inches, you get to about year six before you have that reflective alligator cracking. But you can see if there's no alligator cracking, you essentially have zero alligator cracking after placing the overlay at three inches. And four and five inch overlays, there's essentially no reflective cracking. So the important part of this is if you have a road with existing alligator cracking, according to this analysis, you need at least four inches of an overlay in order not to have that cracking reflect through 
within five to 10 years. If you do not have existing alligator cracking or asphalt concrete layer, you can actually get away with a three inch overlay and have essentially no alligator or reflection cracking. Now they also looked at rehabilitating air vo or rehabilitating pavements with different air voids of an overlay. So you can see here they had a 6.5% air void in the overlay and a 4% air void in the overlay. And the 4% is dashed, the 6.5% is solid. So maybe if you're not getting the proper densification of your mix in the field, that could lead to a higher air voids. And they also looked at three inches of overlays or three thicknesses of overlays. So for a 1.3 inch overlay, it didn't matter what the air voids were, you had the same amount of rutting. But when you got to a three inch overlay or a five inch overlay, especially that five inch overlay, the lower air voids, the 4%, the dash line, had lower amounts of rutting than the 6.5% air voids. So for hot mix asphalt, we looked at actual versus predicted. For Portland cement concrete, we looked at the impact of thickness, dowel bar size, and flexural strength. Here we can look at different pavement structures and different material properties and the impact of that on existing pavements using rehabilitation. So lots of different options. And again, I just scratched the surface of this MoDOT report, but if you Google MoDOT CMR 20-007, there's a lot of good information in this report. And if you want to look at additional readings, um, a lot of my information I got from the Mechanistic Empirical Payment Design Guide, a manual of practice, the third edition. This is from AASHTO and it was released in 2020. NCAT, as always, has a lot of nice reports. Uh, Nam Tran put out a Payment ME Design, Impact of Local Calibration, Foundational Support, and Design and reliability thresholds. So you just need to Google NCAT 17-08. That'll pop up. And like all NCAT reports, it's free of charge to download. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, Mary Robbins also put out a report in 2017, Payment ME Design, a summary of local calibration efforts for flexible pavements. So if you search NCAT 17-07, you can see a much wider range of examples of different states and how they locally calibrated their software. Now, something a little older, but still very nice, uh, Tron and Rodesno in 2013. This is talking about using the AMPT, the Asphalt Materials Performance Tester, in the lab to characterize your asphalt materials and then putting that characterization into Ashtoware Payment ME. So this is looking at a lab perspective and how that lab perspective influences your results. And that's NCAT report 13-04. Now, briefly before, I did mention that states have their own ME design systems. Some states do, and one is the state of Texas. So Joe and all in 2010 put out the report, the development, calibration, and validation of performance prediction models for the Texas ME flexible payment design system. And if you Google FHWA backslash TX slash 10 backslash 0-5798-2, sorry, that's a mouthful, but you can very quickly download that report as well. So at the very top, the AASHTO 2020, that is the, the manual of practice for AASHTOware Pavement ME and the most current one that was available at the time of recording. NCAT has a lot of good information out there. You just need to search that report number. And then also Texas is an example of a state that's developed its own software. And the report that's listed there that you can Google is a phenomenal resource. So in summary, we went over the background of a mechanistic empirical. We went over some principles. Then we dug into the application that AASHTOware has done. And then we finished up with some examples from Missouri. So thank you very much. I appreciate you watching the webinar and I hope that it was useful to you.